Welcome to The Gray Report. If you are a multifamily investor, really any kind of real estate investor, active or passive, maybe you're just in the multifamily, the business, the industry, like for you, you're in the right spot. Now, The Gray Report, we're breaking down all the latest research reports, kind of data, opinions, and throwing a couple original opinions of our own out from the Gray Capital team every single week. Um, so appreciate everyone being on this exciting episode. It's the last Gray Report episode of 2023. I'm joined by Dr. Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing here at Great Capital, also the producer of The Gray Report. A lot of the end of the year stuff to wrap up, predictions, what's different today than last year. A lot of fun stuff. If you want to watch the whole episode, make sure you like this video. You subscribe to The Great Capital YouTube channel to get all these videos straight to your inbox and more. All right, let's get into it. Welcome back to The Report. My name is Spencer Gray. I'm the CEO of a firm called Gray Capital. We buy real estate all throughout the Midwest. Bought over 10,000 apartment units in my day. Matt Bosnagel, though, he is the one with all the information, the data, every single week, kind of getting us up to speed of what's going on in the market. Matt, Merry I Christmas. Bring, Happy New I Year. Happy reports. holidays. <laughs> Thank you. Happy holidays bring, to you as well. Uh, yeah, I bring you, I bring you reports, <laughs> and then I say, what do you, what do you, what, what do we have to think about them? Because, <laughs> because uh, I think that there's a, there's a lot to think about this year, and uh, and I think that we're in a different spot than we were in last year. Yeah, we were just talking about this before we started, Matt. You know, thinking back um, to the end of 2022 last year, and there's a lot of similarities between then and now. Um, this time of year, we're always kind of looking at, okay, how did the year go, and what will the next year bring? And again, a lot of similarities, um, you know, potential mm -hmm. recession is still there. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates are still high. Um, there is palpable uncertainty. Um, there are, you know, geopolitical risks that are, you know, percolating um, and marinating out throughout the world. Um, but some things are different, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we're, we're in a, environment where rates, interest rates may be declining rather than continuing to rise. Consumer sentiment is up more than it was last year. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are more optimistic. I think that there is a sense that there is a light at the end of the tunnel rather than no end in sight. And even again, with that prospect of recession, it seems to be, okay, you know, the concept of a more mild recession getting to the other side, being here sooner, sooner rather than later, rather than, well, the Federal Reserve is going to absolutely crush the economy to bring it into recession. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, the realization of, you know, soft landing was much more of a pipe dream. We were talking about, so we've, I mean, we've been talking about soft landings, Matt, for like two year, year and a half or yeah. so. Um, but it was much more of a pipe dream. Yeah. Now it seems chuckle a little bit. And yeah. And, 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 but, you know, to your credit and to our credit, I think we called out multiple times when the market consensus was, you know, soft landing is impossible. I think we, we saw the glide path of, of it yeah. being possible, not like certainty, but like where I know we totally can see that happening. Um, you know, people are always thinking, are often thinking things will always be worse than they will. Um, that all being said, you know, there's still a lot that yeah. is floating out there that is concerning. We've talked about all of the um, loans that are maturing, not just in commercial real estate, not just office, multifamily, especially, maybe even a bigger deal than office. Not to mention all of the debt that's maturing at the federal government level. It's over like seven trillion dollars is maturing yeah. next year. Not qualified to get in all to those details, but just you know, there's a lot of other undercurrents that are going on that could potentially impact the how this is soft landing or any kind of landing, um, and how the next year unfolds. Now you've been thinking about a lot, a lot of this. You you you'll probably yeah. read more reports than anybody. Um, um, what what, what it, are you what are you seeing? You get you especially know, compared to last year. For for multifamily specifically, which is the, the stuff that I've been reading the most of reports on, um, they all seem to kind of hover around a, a 2024 that looks a lot like 2023, maybe is slightly better when it comes to apartment performance. Um, they all kind of hover around the potential for a, um, for a downturn as well, the degree of which I think is a little bit up in the air. But um, what's interesting is like the numbers for their rent growth are, are so wildly different. Um, I think though, uh, kind of what you said, the differences between 22 
between the end of 2022 and where we are now at, at, at the end of 2023, um, all the differences are to the benefit of us at 2023. It's there nothing. Um, there has, I guess, when you're talking geopolitically, things have gotten things have gotten worse. But like yeah. economically, there hasn't been a major trend that has that has you know kind of been snowballing um, like maybe people were predicting, and. I, I still the back of my mind keep you know looks at all these charts and sees and sees where we're at and and sees you know uh, the the ten year and two year you know the the yield curve that's still inverted and like are we an exception? It would be still for as long as we've held off recession, it would be an exception if we totally held it off. Um, yeah. So that's that's my like lingering doubt is like uh, we're just are we delaying the inevitable and um, but but without something to pin it on I don't you know the only thing that I can pin it on is what you said is what you said earlier is all these loans that are still for higher interest rates and it's still perhaps questionable uh, whether the businesses that took them out or can sustain it or can sustain maybe the difference between free money and yeah. now money costs. I, 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 yeah, it's true. And it's gotten more expensive over the last year and a half or so. We don't know how it's all going to be played out. I mean, yep. the 10 years come down off of, you know, it's hitting 5%. It's basically back down to where it was in August when we wrote our loan maturities report initially. Um, mm -hmm. when, when in that scenario, that, those rate levels, we saw some distress coming. Um, it really needed to come down quite a bit more, closer to 3%, 3.5% to really start helping a lot of borrowers out. Although it's definitely good news for some. One other big factor, Matt, that we haven't mentioned yet is, you know, looking at the, at the stock market, S&P 500. Yeah. Um, at the end of 2022, I mean, we'd gone through a year of declines. I mean, it, it, it was rough. I mean, we started, I mean, 2022 started at the S&P 500 at basically, you know, 4,400. Um, and we ended the year, well, near the end of the year in October, it was down to 3,500. We kind of had a little rally at the end. It got up to 3,900. Well, you know, today to close out as we approach, and this is December 28th, you know, we're almost, we are basically touching our all-time highs. So the whole drawdown that took place in the stock market, um, you know, a year ago, mm -hmm. um, well, or in a year and a half ago, starting in 2022, that those losses have been taken out. And I remember having conversations with investors at the beginning of 2022, when the stock market, the last time the stock market was at, as, at an all time high mm -hmm. and, and the, the investor sentiment was very positive. Everyone was getting ready to do deals. Yep. But then, you know, as interest rates began to rise, you know, the, the market started tanking and that investor sentiment just, just went away. Now yep. we've kind of come back from that, you know, so the beginning of 2023 investors were like, I don't know, you know, you know I'm looking at my stock portfolio and I'm down. Uh, you know, maybe I, I'm I'm basically back to where I was, you know, at the beginning of 2021, entire years of gains are wiped out. I'm not too excited to make any allocations right now, especially in a rising interest rate environment. That kind of scares me. That should hurt real estate. You know, everyone's telling me we're going to go into a recession. All reasonable things to think. But again, now today, you're like, hey, you know, I've got some more paper gains in my pocket. I'm looking at my stock portfolio. I'm feeling good. Everyone's telling me that interest rates are going to come down, whether they really do or not. I, I, my gut is that they're going to stay longer than a little than more than most people want. I don't think the Fed is going to bring the Fed funds down right as soon as everyone is really excited about, just because we're still getting more inflationary prints. We had a jobs um, report that came out today, Matt. Yeah, it came out a little bit hotter than anticipated. The yeah. whole con the geopolitical concerns um, uh, relating to the Houthis and cargo ships going yeah. to the Strait of Oman and the Red Sea. You know, that's inflationary to what extent? You know, there's not as much demand today. So not as much when the Suez Canal was backed up back in the pandemic, but still there's enough inflationary pressures. I think we're going to see continued inflationary pressures on the labor side. Again, just to, you know, from uh, the data point, strong job numbers, anecdote, personal. I don't know, Matt, if you've gone out to a you know, restaurant recently, there's no one working in the restaurants. They, they can't staff anybody. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to hire still. That hasn't gone away. Companies are still, you know, um, you know, hoarding their employees. They don't want to have to go out and try to find people last minute. Um, so I, I think we could see inflation stick around a little bit longer than most people want. But it, it is so in many cases, it's it, it, in some cases, it feels like Groundhog Day. But it is important to acknowledge the progress, positive or negative that we have made yeah. on whatever trajectory, you know, we're on.
Yeah, and that's actually a good a good point. Is did we spend 2023 deferring something, or did we spend 2023 cushioning cushioning the blow of something, or you know actually making progress and fighting back against uh, whatever ultimate downturn might may happen? I yeah. think that we did some work in in you know kind of going the other direction away from away from a severe downturn. But and, and, but and then the other question is, you know, if this, you know, we're just because we brought up the stock market, you know, if it's a forward looking indicator, you know, how far mm -hmm. in the future are we looking? You know, if the losses in 22 were foreshadowing some of the issues we've seen in the you know, the foreclosures that are going on and some of the turbulence in the economy, um, or have we not actually, you know, if it's a full, you know, 12 months, uh, look, look forward even 18 months, which is, I think, longer than most people say it is. But if it's a really mm -hmm. long you know, future indicator, I don't think it's that long, but if it, if it would be, you know. Yeah, the stock market really declined in 22 in anticipation of, you know, future you know downturns and maybe in 2024. I think it's probably stretching it a little bit. But is 2023 saying that, hey, you know, this is going to be, a, you know, a, if there's a if there is a brief down period, it's going to be short and there's going to be good upside right afterwards. Yeah. I mean, for for the general economy or is mm -hmm. it just a signal again, like that no touch landing? We're just going to be ref we're going to midair refueling. We're just going to yeah. keep chugging along in 22. Okay. That was the, that was the deaths and doldrums already. Let's be, yeah. keep, let's keep it going. Good for I, real, good sentiment for real estate in general, I think though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to jump then to the, the conference board. Um, yeah. Cause I think that that really, uh, that really illustrates and, and also viewing it in and pairing it with, I, I also linked this, the uh, university of Michigan consumer sentiment measurement. They're both measuring a little bit of a, like feelings and attitudes towards the current economic moment or um, specifically. You want to you go know, to the uh, university of Michigan uh, consumer sentiment or the U S the, the U S consumer the conference board. Yep, yeah. The that. conference board that. is as the one that has the more positive reading. Now um, you look just to, just to get it out of the way, I guess the university of Michigan shows lowering consumer sentiment um, relatively low um, at the current moment. And, there's a little bit of a different story when it comes to the conference board. Um, they say that consumers have ended 2023 with a surge in confidence and restored optimism for 2024. I think that the real uh, pullout quote for me was when it comes with the when it comes to the expectations and index. It um, it's based on consumers' short-term outlook for income, business, and labor market conditions. It went up from. 77.4 in November. The reason why it's it, it has crossed a threshold of 80%. And by jumping above 80, now we're not going to have a recession anymore. So that's really great. So I just I just want to get that out of the way. Uh supposedly that's the, you know, it, it, this these are the vibes. This yeah, is these, the vibes that like Kyla um Scanlon or um if I'm pronouncing her name right, is what she's alluding to. And just what what are the vibes of the economy, which it's not a new thing. The economy, yeah. the stock market's always been going on on vibes and, and feelings to an extent and how it lines up with the reality. But um, so you're saying the vibes are good. The vibes are positive, Matt. Yeah, I mean, the, the they're caveat, trending. They're trending. They're trending positive in the short term. The huge, huge, huge caveat is that these are also very volatile in the short term. It's a very bumpy road, but at, at the at but at the very least, they are going up, and it's important to to note that like. Uh, that they have crossed that that important threshold that they are better than they were you know um in, in the, at at the beginning of like 2021 or or you know earlier in the in the depths of like the, this recent recession or the the pandemic and um what i think is also more accurate about the conference board is currently they have economic expectations as above the point where they were during the great recession now if you go to if you go to the university of michigan's consumer sentiment index things are a lot worse now um com comparatively um in fact we are about it would seem like we are we are reliving the great recession um when it comes to consumer sentiment as measured by university of michigan um i, I just wanted to highlight that because i don't think that the raw numbers of the now again i am not the arbiter, uh, nor can any man measure or woman or whoever measure anyone else's feelings. But the, these numbers seem different to me. And it seems like the Great Recession was a more powerful, more powerfully impacted the economy than um, than whatever happened, you know, in the last three years of the pandemic. Um, but that's. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a good point. I think it just it seems a little overblown, the numbers from the University of Michigan yeah. sentiment survey. Um, especially relative to um, the conference board, the consumer confidence index. 
I mean, what, what, what do you, what do you think is the, is the difference here, Matt? Is, is it the, the way the data is collected? Um, I, um, so the index of consumer sentiment is based on five questions. Um, one of the, the five questions are, this is the university of Michigan one. Um, and they, then they calculate it up. So they ask people these five questions. They say, we are interested in getting in how you, and how, I'm sorry, we are interested in how people are getting fin along financially these days. Would you say that you are better or worse off than you were a year ago? Okay, that's another one. Now looking ahead, do you think that a year from now, year, things are gonna be better or worse off for you? Okay, and then um, go to business conditions. In the next 12 months, uh, is it gonna be better or worse? And then looking ahead, will the country have good times in the next five years? And then finally, they say, generally speaking, do you think now is a major time or is a good time to buy major household items? So those are the five questions. How, you know, are you better or worse off in the, in the now versus the past? Is the future going to be better? Is the country going to be better? And, you know, how is, are you going to buy some stuff? <laughs> Uh, so so what, what, what about what about the um, for the conference board? What, 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 what are they? Let's see. And you, now, have, you have that? Yeah. In the spot. But um, no, 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 because, because those are all not bad questions, but you know, some of them could be leaning. In, and again, people, you know, the economy always gets political. And, you know, if you take if you ask, you know, how is the country going to be doing in a year? As we've looked at, you know, previous surveys, Matt, depending on your party affiliation and political leanings, um, your response will really be determined more on your views of how politics work rather than the views of the economy. Yeah. So I don't have the exact questions or, or at least I wasn't able to like Google them really quickly, but it does have a, a kind of breakdown of a of, of very, very similar actually uh, indicators of what whether whether they expect business conditions to improve or worsen um and then they have a short-term labor market outlook and they also have income prospects so perhaps instead of are you better or off better or worse off they think are you going to be making money uh more are you going to keep your job are and uh you know how are your how's your business doing i am not so it's going to be a little bit harder for me to pin down the, those exact survey questions i wish i uh wish i came prepared but well, I mean, look how far just the perceived likelihood of a U.S. recession over the recession over the, over the next twelve months is. I mean, that has dropped precipitously since yeah. May of two thousand twenty-three. Yeah. So all that head scratching about, oh, you know, how can spending be up but sentiment be down? Well, one reason is if you're measuring, are you measuring confidence or sentiment? Now, to me, they're both a little bit feelingsy, uh, but different metrics and different sources are going to have different stories to tell, and. Um, this one, I think, from the conference board, there's nothing that makes me think that that's that it's invalid, even though that it's perhaps slightly different uh, than the University of Michigan one. So, um, you know, keep that in your in your research tab. I'm sure everyone has an economic research tab in their browser, and yeah. uh, put them both in there because it's not you know you follow one and you'll get a get, get a skewed view. And I already think that sent consumer sentiment is going to be very. Uh, very volatile uh, going forward when we're going into an election year. Um, you know, it, it's going to be hard for anyone to look past where they, you know, what the politics are and what that might mean. You know, don't feel bad about feeling good about the economy, you know. <laughs> well, if you're, your whole reason is like, you know, I don't like Biden because he's run the economy into the ground. You're not going to turn around and be like, you know, but actually things are doing, you know, eh, the economy's doing pretty good and yeah. he just doesn't have anything to do with it. It's you kind of have to stick to your your, your call, um, yeah. unfortunately. Um, well, so Matt, the vibes are um, conflicted, um, more positive than they used to be, but you mm -hmm. still somewhat conflicted, and, and I think that makes that makes sense. Yeah, um, especially you know that they're um, typically you know a lagging indicator on what actually is going on. Doesn't always mm -hmm. correlate to reality, Matt. Sometimes I just wish because I look again looking at the chart on the um, on the conference board that one the first chart. So I'll bring it back up. Um, where it overlines, um, overlays with uh, recession, you know, again, it's it's a lagging. You know, confidence often peaks, you know, mm -hmm. right before the recession or at the early stages, and you know, drops down as things are picking back up. Um, and yeah. you know, we saw the drop in you know in 2020. You know, again in the financial crisis, it almost in 20 in in 2021, Matt, um, or 22. You know, we should have had a we had a recession, right? We, like we technically mm -hmm. had a recession, but we we didn't technically have a recession. But we had two 
consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. There's a lot of technical reasons why it's that, technically not a recession. But but, but I, I feel like if we it had been called a recession, mm-hmm. we there would have been we would have been able to solve for a lot of questions. Well, well, the, not I, no. I think it would have, they would have been two separate recessions. Mm-hmm. I just think that it would have probably. I think it would solve some of the questions that they were asking of you know why we haven't had a recession. You know, consumer you know confidence oh. absolutely dipped. It, 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 if you dropped in the gray bar like they have for these other recessions. Uh huh. I think that I think it would I I I I would put it you know right in the end of twenty one during when when were those two negative quarters of of GDP? It was in twenty two, right? Right after. So I think you're right. I I think it would come into place when we're seeing this like decline here of consumer confidence, yeah, which looks a lot like um, that's a good point. Back in the great the great financial crisis. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of really smart people that say, you know, there's a reason why it's not a recession. But it, again, it, it then it, it brings up this other concept of, you know, what we typically call a recession. And obviously, the, the economy is not a monolith. There's there's different segments and industries, and things are correlated and related, but not always. Um, you know, they also can act independently. Yeah. We're in, you know, call it stagflation. But I, I don't know. We're, we're it's we don't have the right word. For it, you know, it, yeah. it's, we need more words. It's like the Eskimos. This is like probably not the case. What is this from <laughs> Joe Dirt? You know, what is this for Water Boys? Like the Eskimos have like 20, 20 word, <laughs> words for the word snow or ice or water or whatever. Yeah. I don't. That's probably not true. Maybe, but there's different kinds of ice. There's different types yeah. of economic conditions. I don't think we have the vocabulary because I don't think we're in like what you would call a textbook recession. But it is it is something, and maybe we feel it more because we're in like the real estate world. And if we were if we're in an AI company, we wouldn't feel this way. So this is just coming from me. But we're we're in we've been in some type of economic conditions. Like different paradigm. Since, it does seem like I, the, I'd the say since the, yeah, the Fed raising. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's what like do, what the, do we call it? Stagflationish. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't because everything you know, all yeah. these charts you see the chart go up, and then you can expect things to do something different. And we have been charged for something, for an event that never that never happened, and it, it makes you think that the mechanisms that cause those events there now there's a short circuit, like the gears aren't running as smoothly yeah. of cause and between cause and effect as they are because uh, maybe maybe they work differently. Maybe there's another you know, another input that is, that is driving it or just the relationships have changed. And so that's going to be, you know, it's, it's a little interesting. I'm, I'm sure that this is a short term, you know, the pandemic is, is such a huge, huge factor. And that's like, uh, and, and that probably could explain everything, but. Um, well, it just seems like it's a great opportunity for us to come up with our own name. Yeah. In yeah. Terms. And again, I, I think it has something to do with just the, I think, again, I mentioned this before, but it's, I don't know if it's, you know, time dil- dilation, Mm-hmm. Time compression, but so much ha- so much activity. So there's yeah. so much demand immediately post COVID or during COVID that mm-hmm. it, it 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 just it pulled so much demand forward. And now, in like com- I see it as just compressing, yeah, all this time. And so it's like the the yeah. x, the x axis mm-hmm. has been compressed, and I think it's throwing off our normal understanding of how we're judging things and timing things. Yeah. going to conventional thinking of just you know well you know typically 12 to 18 months well in a normal condition that would be that would be true but we had such an extreme asymmetric event that affected everything not just in the yeah. economy but but just human activity and we're trying to again use the analogies from a decade or two like if you think about the context of like we're just think we're just using examples for not even going back a hundred years. We're just saying, well, how does this line up for the economic? We've only had, you know, what, you know, eight recessions or so since like with the Great Depression. Yeah. Well, there's probably more than eight scenarios. There's probably a... Yeah, I know. Well, even with the yield curve thing, Can't it's we like, go okay, back your track record's like 12. Or, or like, I don't get it. So even with the yield curve, like that's not necessarily like a scientific law, you know, you got to drop the apple and let it fall in order, you know, to, to discover gravity like a million times. For, for people's <laughs> job, for people's job, that is like basically statistics, not exact, yeah. but like a, it's it's like very a lot of statistics. Yeah, like the sample size just doesn't like they were using just seems pretty small. Yeah, um, yeah. And because we were like, well, it's like the '90s now, because it's like you know we we had a little bit of a soft landing in the '90s. Okay, I, I get that, but you know, before it was the '70s. Um, you know, yeah. are we back in the nifty fifties, you know, and then, mm-hmm. but then before all this happens, like maybe we're going to be into the roaring twenties again. 
And it's like, okay, those were all times. And, but like, can we all acknowledge that all of those circumstances don't mirror each other? Yeah. Yeah. And like there, we can, there, it's more likely that there are more novel economic scenarios than like ones that reflect what has happened immediately in the past. Not that we shouldn't learn from what's happened in the past and that is like yeah. good information, but we need to stop saying it's going to be like the nineties. It's going to be like the seventies. Yeah, it is. And, and the kind of, and I even am feeling bad for, for saying this right now, or even thinking it, everyone's thinking that like, well, we have to pay for it. And like we, you know, rates were so long, we have to pay for it. We, you know, we were thinking it was going to be so bad. Like we've got, you know, obviously we've got to pay for it. He can't land the plane. Like that's, that's impossible. Like no one can cross the Atlantic on a, <laughs> and yeah. like, and, and, yeah. and so what if we did learn how to do it? Like, what if we, what if we did, you know, is it impossible? I don't know. Um, But, but like, it's not, it, it seems a lot more po possible now than it used to be. Well, and shouldn't we say anything's possible, I guess? I mean, history, you know, that doesn't repeat. It rhymes, you know. Then there's also the saying, of, you know, this time you know, it's going to be different, but it never really is. You know, again, there are, are some like... Cycles. I mean, if we are in an economic crisis that has followed a made... So I'm talking about the Great Recession. Um, we have the Great Recession kind of loomed... Uh, 2008 loomed over, you know, the next 15 years. And now we're 15 years later and another economic crisis has happened has the lessons we learned or has any kind of safeguards that we put in place or any kind of like consumer attitudes or business attitudes have they insulated us against what was worse or um or you know did we forget everything i, I don't know yeah i don't know i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> matt we're just trying to figure it out every week yeah, let's, yeah, switch, yeah. let's let's switch to talking about apartments um yeah. there was a um we got this real page article you want to yeah, let's let's do the real page. Yeah, that, that that sounds seems fun to me. Okay, so what we got right and wrong about the apartment market in two thousand and twenty three. This is authored by friend of the show Carl Whitaker from the Real Page team. Um, Matt, we were just talking about this. You know, twenty twenty three yeah. to this year. What did they get wrong? This what did they a, get right? What did they get wrong? So it wasn't oh, like. Carl. It, it wasn't they didn't they didn't have like numbers they were just like three types of markets that they said right. would would do good three types that they thought would struggle and they were like well okay did these types fit our predictions and i think they were like all but like one or two were right so i'd give them at least a b plus if not an a minus um but here's their uh, here's their scorecard really their categories so for high performance they they thought that the three types of markets that were going to do well in 2023 were college towns that was the first category. Second category is affordable, low beta markets. And the third category is markets with high job growth. For college towns, they were pretty dang right on this one. And I think this would, it's like a really interesting play. If, you know, if you were like, if you could get in and out of the market at the right time, and it was a more of a liquid uh, market uh, for, for like buying and selling apartments, timing the pandemic uh, move away from and back to campus would be like a genius move. Because, you know, even now, the the narrative is that people are running away from college when actually college enrollment has increased materially um, from 2023 from before. Uh, people are kind of re returning back to college um, after, you know, a pandemic, uh, a, a lull, a, 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 you know, observable lull in in enrollment numbers but that being said the real i think that the real increased demand came from a little bit lower supply for college towns and i'm you know these the students were coming back and in increasing demand and uh really they said that uh you know for a few a few of these markets for college college towns they they didn't do well but uh most of them did especially yeah. these you know the, the big top ones so yeah um, that's that's it for for the college towns now um, for affordable low beta markets, um, basically the Midwest, <laughs> uh, they have. I, uh, I think Carl just you know, looks at what whatever our strategy is, Matt. I know, and, I know. And, like, and, well, and, and they're like, well, this is what great capital is going after. So these are the, because, I, and again, I'm not just like, oh, great capital where we we you know do anything that special. I think we do, mm -hmm. but we invest a lot of college. We invest a lot of college towns, and we also invest in affordable low beta markets. Yeah. And and well, they were right. On Maybe it's a, two, just a broken though. clocks, right? Hey, Twice those today. were the two that they were right when it came to strong, um, you know, strong, strong markets. Now the third one, 
we're high job growth markets. Yeah, now, which we don't th- typically go after. I mean, like we want job growth, but yeah. not and, too much job growth is like shooting like a you know flare in the sky, and every investor yeah. comes by and overbuilds. Yeah, in my opinion. and and well, for from Carl Whitaker's perspective as like a predictor of apartment performance, uh, I think you'd be kind of right because he said that's that was where the mixed bag was. They had a little bit stronger hopes for Houston, their hometown market, which performed not as well as they expected, but still. They're not kind of counting that out, that market out, but it is not as clear cut of a story in 2023 where high job growth actually led apartment demand. I think there was just so much apartment supply that you couldn't that you couldn't overwhelm that with job growth, and yeah. and there was no real even no real growth story. I don't think in like in the same way that there was, you know, people were moving into Salt Lake City and and Boise and and all these like and obviously the Sun Belt uh, in in 2020 and 2021 there there was this clear narrative of this is where people are going and I haven't seen that emerge post pandemic I, I you know it, it's it'd be really interesting to see uh, you know how those uh, how those trends pick back up again but that's the story for the positive side so they were all, they were right on the ones you know if they just follow great capital that's that stop at the affordable low beta markets on their way to Houston and that's the <laughs> that's okay um, but for low performance they um, the markets that they predicted to struggle were those with high supply that's obvious we don't need to talk about it it's a no-brainer <laughs> yeah uh, the second one where markets were lost to lease had had vanished and these were a little bit more of a mixed bag and then lifestyle markets, which I just kind of mentioned, you know, these are the, the Boise's the I, I put in, what, what did I say? Um, Salt Lake city, maybe, uh, maybe your, your Knoxville or Asheville or the mountain climber places where people like to go hiking in mountains and, uh, and, you know, all the beach places too. <laughs> uh, they were, they were hit, but, but you know, they're coming back. I think that it is probably they're going to be hit because so many developers moved in on what are relatively smaller communities rather than, you know, if you're hitting a job, high job growth market, then that may be a little bit different and maybe more of a population center than a lifestyle. And kind of like, I don't say tourists, uh, but uh, but that, you know, it, it seemed like that. Yeah, but, you know, I just just to, I just say, you know, that this is not thinking as an apartment investor, but thinking mm-hmm. of, I don't know, just a non-apartment investor. A lot of those lifestyle markets, it's actually probably good news for a lot of the people in those lifestyle markets. Yeah, because I agree. A major challenge for, I guess, like hospitality and tourism driven markets is like there is just no housing for the actual people that work mm-hmm. in those industries. And, okay. and so, again, like I'm all about buying in a market where we're going to see solid rent growth that's going to drive returns. Um, but from someone who like maybe like goes and visits these places more than like invests in them, you know, an extreme example is like Key West. Um, you know, like my dad lives in my dad lives in the Florida Keys and and, and the Key West is like a lot of tourism, mm-hmm. as you can imagine. Um, it's very expensive. It's an island. It's you're not making any more land. Mm-hmm. Housing is so expensive. Now, maybe Key West is a bad example because you really can't build there either. It's really hard to build there. But so but but in a market like that, you need more supply. And actually, it's probably a good sign. In the absence of a lot more affordable housing being built, a little bit of softness is probably a welcome sign for a lot of mm-hmm. the folks that um, make our vacations a good time. Yeah, that's a good – and I think that they're probably – That's a non-investor is- perspective, Matt. Well, no, no. I, I think that that's a really good point too, because it, you're all, you're kind of leading yourself down to a to a, a, like a feedback loop, or just like you could be circling the drain in, in the very next moment if you are relying solely on tourism. Because once the prices get to a certain level, then oh, now your housing's gone. Now you don't have anything. You're you're cannibalizing yourself with yeah. by devoting something to people. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have the services then to serve the the tourists that come. Uh, I don't. Yeah, it, it is weird. It makes me think. What? So what? Did, what does Key West do? If if someone if someone like do they have like Airbnb in laws? Like they're like you know anti Airbnb laws that are popping up all across the country. I'm sure they do. I, I'm not as I'm not I'm not a complete expert on the the Key West real estate market. I, it would not surprise me if they had about Airbnb you know rules and regulations. Um, you know they also you know they need to seek they need to meet the demand of the tourists coming there also. Yeah. But I mean, like you remember, we, we were looking at buying um, some affordable mm-hmm. housing in Key West. So that was like the nicest affordable housing you could ever imagine. Um, mm-hmm. And the incomes are really high in the area. So the rents were still strong. 
it didn't make sense because the insurance is just uncertain, crazy. But I mean, it took them, I want to say 13 years from like inception to delivery of that property. I thought you were going to say it took them 13 seconds to sell it because <laughs> I bet it got no. snapped up really quick. <laughs> no, 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 not. I, I don't even know how, I don't even know if I actually traded or not um, yeah. because okay, again, the, insur the insurance was so, uh... no. and it's a whole, that's all their conversation, a whole other topic to get into. But yeah, it was yeah. basically you were going to be paying the, crazy premiums insane premiums for no real insurance like there was no actual yeah. coverage so you have well, to have so much money on hand with the, the, mm -hmm. the deductible it's like a four million dollar deductible i think and to loop it and in, then we'd have to have another four million dollars of cash on hand but that's a, but that is an interesting uh that is an interesting factor like what at what level you know if to kind of classify a market as a lifestyle market or as one that's like kind of like a job growth market and the size and and being able to understand how how like a relatively small market maybe maybe they're under four hundred thousand you know uh, four hundred thousand people population versus like a two two million or or above population you know that could have a very big difference but one could be really the small town could be really popular and that could be a time bomb and so i think that it is worth you know e even if you have a cool mountain in your backyard uh it, it may it may not it may not support you know doubling the the apartment supply in two years or something like true that. It, it may not support support it but the like, other thing we learned you know the similar topic is the one way mm -hmm. to make rents more affordable is to build more apartments yeah yeah but yeah i mean that's just like we that's it's pretty straightforward cause and effect um Really glad that it's been, yeah. You know, so that was definitively the... shown the last year or so. So good stuff. Thanks, Carl Whitaker, and yeah, a little piece. Good job. Yeah, keep looking out for your um your stuff. All right, you already matrix. Yeah, this was the 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 outlook forecast that we didn't that didn't make it into our kind of uh, roundup of forecasts for the past two or three weeks that we've been doing. And uh, their 2024 outlook does, uh, it, it is worth reading. It is worth its addition here. I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I left it off so that I'd have a little bit more to talk about today uh, because this period between Christmas and New Year's is, is a relative dead zone when it comes to uh, when it comes to reports coming out. So I save the best for last is what I like to think of it. Um, they have, um, well, I think that this is a good a good excuse as any to to tell everyone where all of these forecasts stand, um, where Yardi Matrix predicts rent growth in in twenty twenty four, and where um, where a bunch of the other ones do too. So I have them written down here, and let's just let's just cut straight to the chase before we get into the Yardi Matrix report itself. Um, I think before my preamble to all of these numbers is, I think they're all so. Yes, supplies. Su since supplies gonna be the same, so that's that. I, I'm kind of taking that out. Obviously, we're all gonna be hit by supply. So the real factor that changes these numbers to me is because they don't disagree on supply, is their disagreement on the economy. Um, otherwise, like I don't know what they're. Some of the math in this is like, wow, they're coming up. There's but there's a, math involved, or is it just? No, no, numbers? no, no, no. Well, no. Okay, it's just. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just numbers. It's, it's not. <laughs> Well, no, you'd think that there might be math involved, but there sometimes no, no, there's not. I don't think there is a stitch of math. This is just heart, uh, uh, heart yeah. and, and feelings. <laughs> but, but Which is, which honest, which sure. like might be better than trying to do the math. Yeah, the yeah. CPU. Well, right. even, even Carl. Uh, well, I, isn't I, that all economic? I mean, it's all, it's what economics, that's why it's a soft science, Matt. It's, it's, funny that, it's funny that you mentioned that because Carl Whitaker himself wrote that. He said, uh, what did he say? But it's not an exact science. We're just making best informed guesses based on data and gut feeling. It's like, aren't we all? So um, if, if I feel like the people that are willing to admit that are the probably the people with the most accurate numbers. But regardless, Yardi Matrix, 1.5% uh, rent growth uh, by the end of 2024. So that's their number. Okay, 1.5% for, for Yardi. Yeah, Freddie Freddie Mac says one point two percent, CBRE one point two percent, Cushman and Wakefield negative two and a half percent rent growth, Marcus and Millichap one point five percent rent growth, CoStar three point five percent rent growth by the end of the year. Um, the, the average of all of them is one point zero six seven rent growth, and uh, that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, I think that if you take out Christmas <laughs> Wakefields, which I, you know, they mentioned 
in in that forecast. Yeah, t- tell us about it because I mean that's an out. I mean it's a pretty big they, outlier. They mentioned a downturn in that in their forecast, but it wasn't all doom and gloom. They throw they threw that negative two and a half out and then went to the next topic like it wasn't a big deal at all to talk about. And I don't know why it wasn't. It was very strange. Now, but do you think there could be making up a little bit from their miss last year? Because I don't, I don't, I don't know if we were able to dig them up, Matt. But I, I remember last we did the same thing last year, and in the calls for the most part for rent growth in twenty twenty three were almost across the board three percent, and, and it had no, there was no math behind it. It was well, we don't. It was uncertainty driven to a, like a, a fallback standard assumption which seemed really lazy at that it was basically like we don't know three percent it, it was obviously negative um in most cases and so it's cushman you know in an so, about face like maybe we'll, we'll get the average right over the next two years i i, I believe two. you know that could that could very well be it let me um or does it I, even matter does it even matter is you it know, just, I, just there i don't i don't think that they're really necessarily making up for it because i don't rem- i think that i remember marcus and millichap had a really high one it was three. Uh, I remember it was, it was, I remember, yeah, it was three because yeah. that was like the historical average. And I'm like, all right, well, that's, you know, that's how it is every year. Um, but I don't I don't remember exactly Cushman and Wakefield, um, you know, making it that high. Now, I do know that in the article itself, they had, uh, you know, they really didn't seem to emphasize a level of economic catastrophe that would be commensurate with that low number um so and just the supply is that is that what they're attributing it to is just like normal normal demand but just such a great amount of supply that we'll see that probably. yeah I, you know it makes me well it, the fact that they are able to, to put that out there and in a reasonable way like thinking well yeah you sh- you guys got to be ready for this obviously like yeah it was just gonna be this year it's gonna be sluggish rent growth negative 2.5 percent we're always going to be adjusting um my pushback against that I, I think yeah, it may that sounded realistic a year ago, um, but but having been through this a, a year of this already, I don't know if I don't I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case for for a whole another year absent a a, a full blown recession. Um, they didn't really they said downturn. They didn't necessarily say recession. I'm thinking that they they may just no one wants to make a recession. Everyone is very hesitant to make a recession call right now because everyone missed their recession call last year. So they don't want to be, yeah. you know, cry wolf twice in a row. Matt, you know, I'm trying. So I'm thinking through. It's like, what, what, what uses, what, what use are these numbers? And, and I question the usefulness. And then I'm going to tell you why I do think they're useful. But the reason why they're not useful is because, like you said, it's literally just, you know, direction of the wind. How do I feel? Sort of maybe there's some data, but it's mostly just how we feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, these are national numbers. And like, so yep. no one's investing in the national apartment community. It's all super local. But what what so what I think this is reflecting CoStar is different though. I'm going to take CoStar out of it because that, that's much more data driven, at least in my um, understanding. Although they are, their analysts are making some calls, typically it's more data driven based on their forecast by Oxford um, Analytics. But mm-hmm. so anyway, what I see these, especially from DRDs, Freddie, but especially the brokerage firms, the firms that have like a monetary interest in like doing deals. Yep. Um, they usually are like, hey, that, let's think there's going to be some good growth. To me, this is them saying, we are not super optimistic for performance next year. We don't want to say yep. negative because we mm-hmm. have to make a living and we haven't had any revenue. We need to have some positive growth. Negative, A negative would just be would throw up red flags, especially in a year of negative growth. Two years of negative growth really doesn't, it, it really screws up performance in returns. Mm-hmm. And so... It's it's which direction is the wind blowing, and sort of the velocity of the wind. And they're saying that it, it's it's not necessarily blowing in the great direction. They're they're feeling not great about the apartment market for next year. How much of 2023 is influencing their outlook on 2024? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure because again, it's all feelings. And as Matt, you and I have documented throughout this year. The feelings of the entire economy change every three weeks, or yeah, four weeks. Yeah. I mean, it goes from certainty of a recession, certainty of rates staying higher for longer, and for a five percent, we're getting ready to go to five and a half percent. We're going to stay up here forever. Yeah. It is certain, like we know now, this is exactly. And then, literally weeks later, ten-year Treasury comes down just to where it had been before, and people are like, "Oh my gosh, I've never seen the ten-year Treasury this low. Everything is great. We're going to a soft landing. There's the recession has been canceled." 
you know, thanks, um, Santa Pal for giving us a great Christmas yeah. for the stock market and mentioning rate cuts, not doing anything, just mentioning them. It's all, it's all feelings. And so this is a collection yeah. of feelings of, of, of apartment, um, industry eco economists and analysts and, and, uh, experts, but are also is being driven by you know, the firms they work for have incentives yeah. to do deals and sell real estate and they do better yeah. when the multifamily industry is doing better. So if those people are saying it might be a little bit of a rough year, maybe it is choppy, but yeah. again, but, but then again, are they being influenced by a choppy year already and they're mm -hmm. hearing their firms are not bringing enough revenue and we've looked at some of the, how much the revenue has dropped in some of these firms. It's a lot, a lot of them have a lot of debt. Again, I think we should do a correlation of their projections and then their own like firm performance and see if there's any correlation. Yeah, um, I do. You know, I, what I think the value of reading all these or, or, or just like keeping an eye open to what these projections are is, you know, if they're all over the place, which they kind of are, then that could be a key that there's some opportunity there, that there's some information that people are ding, missing ding, ding. or misrepresenting that, uh, that yeah. you can kind of seize. And, and again, that's where I, I, I absolutely believe. And again, since it's all feelings and not like facts, and if there was facts, everyone would be straight. Everyone would know. So they would do it. My feeling is this, like we are now in like today, a great time to buy real estate, like really, really good. And it's always going to be, when sentiment is is low, even though consumer sentiment is getting better, but it's when on real estate, if you look at real estate sentiment, it would be mm -hmm. pretty low also, yeah. and it would or it would be low, and it's in those that's the time to buy. And so when they, when people aren't sure, some people say there's going to be you know if we see a spread one you know CoStar saying three and a half growth, Cushman saying two and a half negative. I mean that's a big spread. There's dislocation. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be that uncertainty is going to lead to um, less decisions being made by some buyers and he creates huge opportunities for those who say, well, I'm not going to go off the gut of these guys. I'm just going to go off my own gut of what I think yep. is a good time to buy, which is like, that's what we're doing. Um, and they're going to plow ahead and find some great deals. Yep. Um, so again, it's useful. It's not useful going to keep looking at it all the time and appreciate yeah. bringing it to us. What else is in this Yardi report, Matt? The, uh, the other thing- not a huge report. People should read it, but give us yeah. the highlights. So the other, so the only other like a kind of major thing that I wanted to note on this one was um, that they, you know, they're saying rent growth will stagnate. Obviously supply is going to be, um, is going to be a drag in, in 2024 for apartment performance and rent growth, just as it was in 2023. Um, but also the, the fact that rent growth, growth has already gone up so much since the beginning of the pandemic has like has a collective toll that it has taken on rent on um, demand from renters or their capacity to pay too and they uh, they highlighted a rent to income ratio that is I think they said 270 basis points above where it was at the beginning of the pandemic or, or just like January 2020 that is so we so affordability has has lessened a little bit, but I would venture to say that um, overall housing could be uh, that this guy, this could be a more permanent feature of the cost of housing in in America, unless and unless single family home prices go down a, a lot more too, and 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 things really, you know, we're not building enough houses. See, that's um, why I think we're gonna I think we're mm -hmm. gonna continue to see wages increase. Matt. Yeah, I, I just don't see how they can't. Um, yeah, people are gonna are gonna continue to demand more because they have to. Um, wages are gonna continue to rise. Um, they're gonna have to catch up to these rents, and, and it's gonna that's gonna be required until we still see any sort of you know really meaningful um, rent growth. And yeah, but then Matt, I'm just gonna skip skip ahead just because totally it's fun and I can. And well, you can tell me not to. It's all right. No, but no, no. Top three, 20, 2024 forecasted rent growth by Metro. Now we're getting a little bit more local instead of national. Um, again, a big change from like the norm, a uh, big change from your normal year. People are like, where are going to be the, the fastest growing rent growth markets? And again, we're talking about different growth. We were like job growth, population growth, really, I mean, really good forward looking indicators. But there's a lot of other variables at the end of the day. I mean, it's kind of what your cash, the net cash flow at your property is. But that's obviously mm -hmm. largely attributed by the amount of rent you can in, in, 
you can charge and your expenses, but looking at how much rent you can charge with our rent growth looks like typically we're going to see the Sun Belt markets, those really high growth markets often in this top of this list. Matt, the top four markets um, are all Midwest um, markets for forecast rent growth. Kansas City, Columbus, Indianapolis, um, Twin Cities, uh, t- Kansas City, Columbus, Indianapolis, the Twin Cities, then Nashville, which is technically in the South, but it's like close enough to the Midwest that it's it's not the Midwest, but it's <laughs> it's not it's it's like technically Sun Belt, but I don't know. I think it's like a little bit of halfway there. Um, and then Vegas, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Detroit. So you know, to Phoenix, which is seeing a lot of negative rent growth this year, mm-hmm. seeing it coming back. Um, and then, and again, it's you know, and I, the reason why I pinpoint that the Midwest is going to be seeing a lot of growth is because also cap rates in the Midwest are typically a little bit higher. You can get better deals on property, and the reason for that is people say, well, you know, a market like I'm just going to get down to the bottoms. I'm sure there's a good example. A market like Boston or Atlanta or mm-hmm. Tampa or Austin um, or even Miami or Denver or Dallas or Charlotte or Raleigh Durham. They're like, these have so much growth. I'm going to pay up. I'm going to pay a lower cap rate for the growth. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, that's great. But what if you don't get the growth? And that's what's happening right now is people paid up for the growth. Instead of growth, they, they thought negative number and they may see a negative yeah. number the next year. And they're saying, well, but there's all these jobs. That's great. That's going to probably affect demand in a couple of years. Um, not necessarily right away, because a lot of times those job numbers are, you know, lagging other than, other than the, the metrics that are like, these are the jobs created today. Mm-hmm. Um, the reality is, again, where are the rents going? And there, you have to look at the big picture beyond just the all the demand and the supply drivers. There's a lot of other variables and yeah. the stability of the Midwest of being not oversupplied with steady demand. Um, and much more just stable economies, you know, they, they, there aren't, they aren't always the huge engines of growth that um, a Phoenix is, but there's, you know, how many times you get burned by the heat of that growth to say, you know, yeah, there's a potential for high returns. And believe me, I know some people who just absolutely crushed in those markets and, and people will again, time and time again, they're going to well, crush I mean, in those high I- growth markets, but Different people who just are losing a lot right now. Also, and you know, like different uh, different markets, maybe for different times. Now, I, I think that true. There's yeah. always a reason to to think about the Midwest and and its steadiness. You know, fits a lot of uh, fits a lot of buckets. But like right now, thinking about thinking about the Sun Belt is probably not a not a great not a great idea. There's not a good story behind it. 2021 it was great but uh well, i don't know maybe yeah. maybe it, it soon it will be and again i'm like yep. a more midwest guy um but if the prices are way down in the sun belt you can get a discount relative maybe to the Phoenix midwest full and deals. there's yeah. and they stop building you, you could find that that sweet spot again because again they've been incredibly profitable markets i mean the they, the returns have been really i mean they've been great in a lot of markets including the midwest but um if you the, here's the challenge is you can mm-hmm. you can time it wrong in those markets. Yeah. Yeah. Timing That's is a, a factor. It, it, there's yeah. a boom in a bus cycle, whereas the Midwest markets, there's there's much they're much more stable. They're much more linear. It's just again, I'm not saying we're mm-hmm. always winning because nothing's nothing's certain, but we are maybe we're discounting some of the huge returns that we maybe could have for just a much higher probability of success. And then just my experience we get just as high returns as people investing in the Sun Belt. I talk to folks yeah. investing only in the Sun Belt, and they tell me about their returns, and then I tell them about some of our deals, and the return metrics are very similar. Yeah, um, may, maybe because the cap rates, are low, cap rates are high, a little higher in the Midwest, and yeah, yeah. now they, the cap rates really Midwest. compress in a crazy way in the Sun in the Sun Belt. So, like, in a, it, you could mm-hmm. if you sold it, if you bought a deal in Phoenix back in two thousand and thirteen, fourteen, fifteen for mm-hmm. a five and a half cap or a six cap. Which in Indy, maybe in Indy we would have said that was expensive at that time, maybe maybe not. But then it compressed down to a three cap. Well, yeah, you you just you just cr- absolutely hit a home run in in Indiana or in Indianapolis. Okay, maybe we bought it at a six six and a half cap. It compressed down to a five. We still got you know great appreciation. May have not have been extreme, but we're never going to get down to that four three and a half percent. Well, we got to four, but we're never going to get down to the, like the three percent cap rate range. And we'll and we'll expand a little bit, but um, we the we don't rise as high, and we also have much less room to fall 
And then there's some tactical scenarios of where you can get into some submarkets that are seeing Sunbelt like growth, but are even more stable. Sometimes yeah. they can be oversupplied a little bit, but no, I over generalize. Okay. So I have one question that I that I was thinking of as you were talking about this is it, and it's a it's a little bit out of left field. You know, we talked about the things about now that are different than the things uh, at the end of 2022. So I think key differences. Is there going to be a like, – I have one locked and loaded, so don't worry if you can't think of anything. Uh, uh, is there going to be a story or narrative um, or, or, you know, development trend, call it what you will, that emerges in 2024 that's going to be a little bit different um, than what we've seen in 2023? A dev on the development side? Well, on on either on on either kind of the renter development side or, or on the capital market side, is is there you know, and maybe one of each if you if you want. But uh, I I uh, I feel like it's a it there's a little bit more opportunity for uh, a, a a different world when it comes to uh, when it comes to the capital markets, especially than um, than the rent because it seems like the supply is still going to be high for 2024. Yeah, the, the well, man is I'm not, I, I don't know if this is an answer to your question, Matt, but I mean, the capital markets, you know, we're talking about apartment fundamentals, which is important, mm -hmm. but capital markets are going to be a huge game changer on one yeah. way or the other. I mean, one, in one in one sense, I can bring distress with all these loan maturities that are coming to do that can't be paid back in full. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, as interest rates are lower, it creates a better, uh, better financial conditions to acquire um, assets, and that should unfreeze and thaw um the apartment market that the that has largely been um you know partially from not saying completely frozen because plenty of people are, are there are still deals getting done but the mm -hmm. volumes are down you know 60 plus percent depending on who you ask um so in a more favorable you know interest rate environment capital markets the money should be flowing yeah that should really um come back the volumes now the one thing that could throw a wrench in the gear Again, if we have a recession, liquidity gets tightened up again. Mm -hmm. Now, multifamily has a unique advantage compared to other commercial real estate in that we have um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD um, all very active in multifamily financing and really kind of serve as a, a lender, not just of last resort. They're often the first lender you want to go to because they have great terms. They really kind of backstop the industry and always providing liquidity, just understanding how important the real estate um, market is in multi especially multifamily and housing to the general economy. So you know the but but we could see some turbulence if we if we see a recession. Mm -hmm. um, again, multifamily should be okay, but you know again, if it puts pressure on some of these lenders to actually have have to foreclose and take over deals and start um, calling some of their notes um, from their borrowers that they've been kicking the can down the road. That could accelerate some, you know, negative vibes for sure. But again, yep. would also usher in um, some ultimate buying opportunities. So, yeah, I that's that's kind of what I was thinking about, and and, and more more or less is is the met. So it, yeah, it did is, I did I answer your question? Or did I did I no miss no? It? What, I were think you, it, what were you thinking? Yeah, you, you I, said I, you had I think up. about the negative feedback of. Of of slower apartment performance versus the excitement of lower interest rates, and so the lower interest rates are going to happen later than uh, later than it that will take for apartment performance to improve. So there's going to be an intersection point, or there's going to be a point at which you know, um, which it feels pretty bad, I think. And I wonder if I and so there will be a little bit of a vulnerable moment, but I. I do think that another backstop will be like people's hope in lower rates and um, that will let people kind of hold on for maybe a little bit longer. And, uh, but uh, the other possibility is a little darker is, are we going to see, you talked about feedback from the banks if, if, if their borrowers aren't, aren't paying them back, but what about feedback from investors to operators and syndicators? And uh, you know, if they if their investments aren't performing, is that even, you know, is, we heard earlier this year about you know all of the people coming back to I think it was was it Blackstone and and they wanted like redemptions yeah so yeah. is anything like that going to happen in in 2023 or is there going to be a whole lot more hope 
And uh, yeah, I think I, there's so, but I think especially on the institutional side, people are getting much more bullish. Like I said, I think people are starting to come around and realize, like I just said that, okay, this should be a great time to buy real estate. Mm -hmm. Even though it seems scary right now, um, there's been a lot of reports that Blackstone is getting ready to make a lot of acquisitions. They're 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 really gearing up. Um, also, the last time I, I looked, the with the redemption request of, uh, from like BRE Blackstone's flagship mm -hmm. fund are way way down. Um, they're you know they're they're yeah there's some redemption requests, but it's not like you know they weren't able to fulfill them like they were. Um, yeah. a, 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 I think about a year ago or so when that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there is going to be some pressure. Um, I don't, I, I think that, you know, the reality is that, um, no operators had you know, negative assumptions in their, their, in their models. Yeah. And so performance generally across the board, not that there aren't some great outliers. Um, but for, you know, deals that were done in 21, 22, um, most, you know, again, this is generally aren't performing as well as the, um, operators and investors would like them to be performing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think there's, you know, it's, it's on the, it's on the sponsors to, you know, work harder to outperform given challenging circumstances. I think a lot of investors understand, um, that yep. no one really anticipated how fast rates would rise and how much supply really would be coming online and how much you would be affecting um, the markets. I think sponsors should have known a little bit of all of this. Um, we knew some of it, didn't know all of it. Um, we've had some deals that have been outperforming. We've had a couple that have, you know, that have, have struggled more than we'd like. That being said, I mean, it's very common for deals, especially like a value add deal, when you go through a year or two of kind of working through some things before yeah. the, the the deal stabilizes, mm -hmm. and I know that doesn't get talked about a lot, unless you're in a group of seasoned multifamily or just real estate investors, mm -hmm. and everyone just understands that's the reality. Like I talk mm -hmm. to if I talk to a seasoned investor, and we and when we say you know well in the first year or two cash flow is going to be lower because you know we're executing our business plan, la da 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 da, and you know some more green LPs may be like, well, why can't you get to 10%, you know, year one? It's like, yeah. well, that's just like not feasible. Like we're you know, building the basketball court or probably not a basketball court, but <laughs> what, a, what a, yeah, I don't know, whatever sports analogy. Yeah. 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 But, uh, but um, no, but we have to, I mean, one, there's like, we have to turn over the rent roll. Like we can't just change the rents on day one. If we have to actually make improvements, we have to get yep. access to the units. Mm -hmm. so, so there's like physical limitations on how quickly you can move. Yeah. Um, but sponsors and GPs will often compress the amount of time that takes so they get it all done in the first year. Um, or sometimes some will mm -hmm. even basically yeah. say that their model basically begins like after they've done all the work. And so like, they're like, well, we're, we're going to show you a stabilized pro forma. And, yeah. we're, and they're like, how long? And, and, and stabilized pro forma, pro forma has 10% cash on cash. It looks really great. But then you ask, well, how long will it take to get stabilized? And they're like two years. So, well, well okay. Well, that yeah, that's not. This isn't really. I mean, yeah, it's a pro forma, but it's not yeah. really. Well, it's not, and that's it's not as useful to an investor trying to anticipate how much money they were going to receive the first year. And that's it's kind of what from material. my yeah from my from my perspective as a marketer, you know, and like trying you know communicating with investors, telling them like. This is how things are going to be about the market. This is how things may could be about this opportunity. Um, I, there's a responsibility, but there's also feedback that you get from um, from investors, and you know it, it's it, it's going to be really interesting how how the lag there because I think there is sometimes you know there are people that expect that they expect a year, but how long how long can that last? Can that those even those seasoned vet veteran how long can their patient before their patients a little bit worse thin um and you know i don't think that it's it's not like people are going to come with porches and pitchforks and stuff but like i do i do wonder if it changes the behavior of some syndicators if they realize oh you know um a lot of our you know a, a lot of our 
investors are coming back to us and are, have been displeased with the amount of returns that they're getting, maybe we shouldn't be churning out deals like this over and over. And well, you have to ask it. yourself: is is it is it is it you, or is it is it the economy, or you know, yeah. the, if it was you, were there? Did you learn anything um, mm -hmm. all with those mistakes? Because you you look at it two different ways. You could say. I'm not capable of doing this. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna just throw my hands up. I'm not doing any more deals like this. It's just not for me. Yeah. I'm just I'm yeah. just frustrated and like uh, I just not. The other way to look at it is okay. You know, um, this last two years um, didn't go exactly your year and a half or whatever. It's not gone the way that you know we anticipated. We thought that it, thought that it would, but to you know you know quit the race before you've actually you know finished running um, yeah. on the potential. You know, we're on the eve of potential great opportunities. And so I just see, you know, throwing in the towel now um, as being short sighted. And I think a lot of LPs yeah, understand yeah. that also, you yeah. know, because they, they made decisions to invest also. No, no one forced them to invest. Um, they're looking at the same economic conditions. Tr you know, sponsors, you know, they're, they're entrusting the sponsors. But I think they're coming to similar realizations, you know, and again, it's going to be bifurcated into either like, well, I tried multifamily investing and that just, it's no good. Um, or they're going to say, well, wow, you know, that timing sucked. Um, you know, it's been a, you know, multi, you know, a, more longer than a decade bull run. And, and I invested, you know, and, and the last, you know, the last inning. And now those deals are going to, you know, I'm not going to lose that great. Thing both you're not losing money on those deals. Maybe they're just not hitting the mm -hmm. returns that you thought you were going to, or you have to chart in different course, how to get to those returns yes. in a different way. Mm -hmm. But then it's like the home runs, the bangers. Are twelve are, are right in front of us. Mm -hmm. so you can't quit the race until you, I mean you have to, you have to run the whole thing and you have to run through the finish line and keep moving. If you think that the if you believe in the thesis in the idea in mm -hmm. that you know housing there's inelastic demand it's a need everybody needs a place to live. We are still under housed even with all the the supply that we're building we're still under housed in this country. We still need to build you know uh, at least three million new housing units to get even close to where you know we've got enough. So even with the million that are, you know, in the, in the, that's in the pipeline, well, that, that's a third. And so if you still believe in, in, and you made the conclusion that multifamily is one of the best risk adjusted investments you can make with tax benefits, all of the, all the reasons to invest in multifamily, if those things are still true and you just, if we just happen to go through a interest rate hiking cycle on the back of a pandemic um and kind of global melt down up whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. well are you going to judge multifamily you're going to judge the sponsor because of that i think you can judge the sponsor way before you can judge multifamily and so if it's not if it's just the market and it's it's the timing and maybe it's the sponsor well multifamily is still good and it's no reason to kind of get out of the game if anything yeah. I'm never going to tell anybody to double down after, you know, a loss, I, you know, you don't want to get into that type of mentality. But again, if, if we are in, if, if, if the economy, like all things, you know, nature work through cycles and periods, we are getting ready for a really good one. And, and, may, and maybe it's further out than, than I think it is yeah. where I want it. I want it to be because don't we all want it to be tomorrow? Well, and but, what I, my sense is, or no, my hope is, is that, is that increased sales activity in in the multifamily market will at least lead to a price discovery and i don't think the i don't think it means that we're going to get the super profitable cap rates or or you know it's going to be crazy rent growth opportunities like it was 2 years ago it no. will be more normal you know uh, a real like work for your money kind of investment and yeah you're ready to be fun. a little bored it's going to yeah. be it's yeah. going to be it's going to be a little, and it usually is boring like it yeah. usually like the last two years, two years ago, wasn't normal. Like we're, it's usually a boring industry, slow and steady, and you know mm -hmm. we're, we're fixing the toilets, and you know we're, we're doing the dealing with residents and re renovating units and doing the right thing, and um, finding good deals yeah. that make sense based on what you know the cash flow they're throwing off. It, back to the fundamentals, and it's going to be new to some folks, um, but I'm excited for it. Yeah, me we're too. Ready to go, Matt. This was a great episode. Any, any closing comments? Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, yeah, Happy Holidays, yeah, um, uh, yeah. You were sick. You were sick on Christmas, or 
it, I was Christmas I was sick on Christmas. Sick. It was like all of the it was twenty twenty third, twenty fourth, twenty fifth took me out, and I missed like all of the family stuff. I was like I was telling you before is like, you know, I'll, sometimes you get annoyed by all the stuff you have to do, but uh, it, but like no, they're they're fun. <laughs> but it, but missing, really but, there. but it feels empty not doing yeah. that. You know, oh, not sure. doing this yeah. stuff. It, it, it's yeah. a, it, it's, it's empty. Um, well, man, I'm glad you and the family had a nice Christmas. I'm sorry you were feeling sick. We got a good New Year's. We got some. We, we got we got some cool New Year's stuff that we're planning. Right? We got some oh, sort of yeah. cool, cool posts. Hey, I um, think that we. Uh, I think that we have. Are you going to tease something else too? I didn't know if you were. Good. I could. Yeah, yeah. You 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 start. See if we're thinking about the same I thought thing. I thought you were going to tease that we're going to make a that we'll make a intro music that the we'll yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, that 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 was so. Yeah, um, we are gonna Matt and I, Doctor Boss and Olga, we're gonna be um, we're gonna be writing um a new gray report theme song and, and accompanying music and soundtrack. Um, the will be available eventually on Sp- Spotify. Um, anywhere you can download music. Um, many of you may or may not know about uh, myself and uh, Doctor Boss Noggle. Um. Both are interested in music and music production. I actually went to school for music. I went to music school, Jacob School of Music down at Indiana University, studied recording arts with concentration in composition, played saxophone, that type of stuff, played in bands, recorded, worked in big recording studios in New York City, recorded, you know, folks like um, Bjork, um, Joshua Bell, um, all kinds of stuff. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna remove my background, Matt. It, it, it's 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 not you know the stu- my studio of today is nothing more <laughs> like or, what it used to be. I don't. It's not really much of a studio. It's just kind of in my um, basement where I'm recording this podcast from today. Um, but you can kind of see some of the gear we got behind keyboards and synthesizers and drum machines, and so we're gonna have some fun with it. Um, I've got a New Year's. I was going to tell you, Matt, um, oh, as yeah. you're creating your New Year's content, mm-hmm. bef- you know, I'm going to have some uh, some audio to put in there. Mm. I'm going to have a song. I've got an old Lang Syne oh, rendition. Good. Oh, nice, nice. Done. I just need to record it. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's just we're having fun. So just be on the lookout for some new theme song or new um, yeah theme song for the great report as well as like some transition transition music yeah oh yeah and and uh, outro music we need outro music and I, you know if we have a little segments like this is your weekly number and we're like, do, 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 but, like there's just a lot of good if we if we had a little sound effects box that we could put you know like uh like the shock jocks like maybe we can get there um I'm not opposed to that, it. <laughs> that. That's a much uh, shorter run than uh, the whole song. song I know. Song. I'm a little. I'm Sound a... effects are easy. We could do that. Like <laughs> that's like a the thing we can do. I mean, yeah, or, yeah, that's true. There's a lot of options. <laughs> a little sampler. Yeah, yeah. Um, I people think I, we're crazy, Matt. Well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll bring it down to something a little more grounded. I don't want to leave uh, lose sight of we we have our own forecasts that we're working on for 2024. They're not yeah. going to get stale if we're you know if we actually breach the year the the one year mark you know into into the new year. So uh, they're still going to be valid. They're still still going to be really useful. And they're still, guess what? They're going to benefit from all the other people that have been talking too. So um, well, look out for that. Yeah. And I guess in, in kind of great report fashion, I mean, we were trying to aggregate the best information and put it together. And so basically, instead of reading, you know, 10 different outlooks, we're, we're going to read 10 and then we're going to aggregate it, put our own analysis yeah. spin on it. Um, also go direct to the data. And so we're looking at just the widest volume of information and yeah. try to distill it into the best forecast. And, you know, probably... I think halfway through January, we're going to be coming out with that, Matt. It, it's purpose. We're not doing it before the end of the year because we really want to have it be informed with as much data as possible. And like you said, you know, it's going to be a little bit more accurate that way. So be on the lookout uh, probably mid-January for the Great Capital, um, you know, multifamily market outlook, um, some other cool stuff from the Great Capital. Oh. Matt, thanks again. Happy yeah. New Year. Yeah, you too. See you on the, on the other side of the year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye. Okay. See you, bye.